pesky worms. I don't, I don't know what this was. <laughs> oh, you bastards. It's just too long a sentence. Ah! Just below this video, so... For sake. Let's go back to the start, so... Come on into the ditch. I'm your resident ditch witch, Tara Tyne, and we're about to get witchy, whether you like it or not. Here in Ireland, spring has officially sprung, and this week I have some very timely and very exciting news regarding my online course in herbs and herb magic in the Irish tradition, which is going to be happening with the Irish Pagan School on the 26th of February. The course is now open and available for you to book your very reasonably priced place on. I'll drop the link where you can do that in the description just below this video. Just scroll down, you might need to click a wee arrow on the right hand side just click in there and it should pop up so stick around if you'd like to hear more about what's involved in that but in the meantime to celebrate I thought we'd have a little smorgasbord of some of the weirder rabbit holes I went down whilst putting the course together we've got herbs we've got magic we've got medieval quackery so let's get into it right don't you just hate it when your womb detaches itself and goes wandering around your body? What? Is, is that not a thing? Does that not actually happen? Well, if you were a woman suffering from any one of a vast number of as yet unrecognized medical complaints in medieval Western Europe, there's a very good chance your doctor would put it down to good old wandering womb syndrome, aka hysteria, and probably attempt to use some very smelly or even toxic herbs to cure you. One of the most famous herb influencers of the late medieval period, Nicholas Culpepper, recommended rubbing either burdock or stinking arrack on the soles of the feet, the crown of the head, or around the nostrils, or lady parts, depending on which way the womb had travelled, of course. Pesky wombs. And they could strangle you, by the way. Doctors who believed that wombs wandered randomly around the body also believed that it was possible for the womb to strangle its owner and so it was of utmost importance to coax it back into its rightful place. So when women were in reality suffering from a swollen abdomen, chest pain, shortness of breath, difficulty swallowing, cold hands and feet, tears and laughter, excessive yawning or stretching, delirium, high blood pressure, or even epilepsy or any one of a number of mental health issues, their doctors just wrote it off as hysteria. The best cure for which was, of course, to get married and have sex. <laughs> even Daddy Freud, pretty much his entire theory of psychoanalysis on the treatment of hysteria in women and believe it or not hysteria wasn't removed from the official diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders until 1980. What? I, I can't even. So whilst English men were calling themselves medical experts and using herbs to treat made-up conditions what about the women who were using herbs in an attempt to cure their communities. Well, I'm sure you've heard of the witch trials. And in England and Scotland, there were plenty of them. In Ireland, however, not so much. Most of the few trials which were recorded here, comparatively speaking, were under the influence of English colonizers, and several of those appear to have been a smokescreen targeting women who were getting a little bit above their economic stations and becoming a wee bit too powerful for their rivals. What a surprise! The native Irish, for the most part, seem to have no taste for torturing and killing women who worked with herbal remedies. It's almost as if we said, hey, maybe those women who know what all the herbs are and how to use them for medicine might come in handy in a society where many of us can't actually access legitimate doctors. I don't care if she visits you in your dreams and does dirty things with you, leave her alone. That's not to say that medieval Ireland was an entirely safe or enjoyable place for women to live because 
it wasn't. And if medicine was just growing all over the place, why was it so difficult for your average person to access it? Well, for a start, there may not have been a physician in your area. We know that like many vocations in medieval Ireland, medicine was often hereditary and as a profession, it tended to benefit the ruling and upper classes more than the peasants. The O'Hickeys were doctors to the O'Briens of Thomond, the O'Shields treated the McMahons of Oriel, and the O'Cassidys treated the Maguires of Fermanagh. And so most wealthy and established families would have had a highly trained and highly paid doctor at their beck and call. But what about the rest of us? What about us indeed? It wasn't until 1590 that a Nicholas Hickey, doctor of physic, was appointed by Dublin Corporation as a physician to the poor and a salary of £10 per annum. It cost half a shilling to visit him for a urine test and a full shilling if he had to make a house call to you. And do you think the people in the furthest reaches of Connacht were getting regular house calls from a Dublin based doctor? You wouldn't even get that nowadays. Do you think they even knew there was a subsidised doctor in Dublin charged with treating the poor? Not a chance. And even if a family had the money to hire a doctor in the times before medical regulation, there was a good chance he would turn out to be a quack. Much like our old friend Nicholas Culpepper, he may not have received medical training of any kind before he just set up shop and called himself your friendly local GP. So were you going to spend your shilling on some random dude who just happens to be staying two towns away and could be a snake oil salesman for all you know? Or were you going to visit wee Bridie up the road who your mom and her mom and her mom have been going to for herbal remedies for probably like 300 years and Bridie looking shocking well for a woman of 412 years of age. Mm. God bless her, Bridie for the win. <laughs> and if you went to Bridie with some wild garlic you'd found up the lane and said, Bridie, is this a herb or a vegetable? Well, for a start in medieval Ireland, there pretty much was no way to even ask this question because if it was growing out of the ground and it was edible, it was called either live or loss the interchangeable words used for both herbs and vegetables. Different species of course had their own names and differentiating between certain species and their lookalikes was important so that you didn't poison yourself. But foods weren't quite as strictly categorised back then and in any case, Bridie would have been woefully annoyed at you living next door to the finest patch of wild garlic this side of the river for all these years and not even knowing what it bloody was. Sure it's not a bit of wonder you're all pale and gangly. Needs a good blood cleanse and that one does. But I hear you protest. Surely people weren't actually judged based on the foods they ate. You bet your ass they were. Not least, the entire Irish nation. By England, of course. Under the popular humoral theory, the Irish were thought to be lusty, idle and angry because of our warmest damp climate and our tendency to eat beans, potatoes, nettles and an abundance of white meats. I don't know. And this is really only the tip of the iceberg as to how diet was used as a way to subjugate peasants, the colonised, women, basically anyone who wasn't in the in crowd of rich white men who basically ran the world. Phew! Thank God things are completely different now, huh? <laughs> One thing that was very different about medieval versus modern Ireland was that stealing herbs or vegetables from someone else's garden was sometimes legal. For example, any law-abiding person was allowed to gather medicinal herbs for a sick person from anywhere they grew without penalty. A hungry person was allowed to take a handful of hazelnuts from a privately owned wood. And pregnant women were allowed to steal any morsel of food they were craving. Actually, it's even more wide open than that. It says anything she desired. Hmm. Any ice cream grown in your garden. As opposed to these days, if Mrs. McArdle caught you with a pair of snips in her newly blossoming wildflower bed, I'll tell you she'd be out with the broom before you could spell your name, pregnant or not. But what if you really needed the herbs, like it's the 30th of April and you've had a very lucrative year, butterwise, and you're scared that the fairies and or the witches might come and take away all your abundance and wealth and tasty, tasty butter. Well, you probably wouldn't find what you needed in your neighbor's garden. To be honest, you were probably going to have to look a bit further afield for that. Baltana in medieval Ireland was a time filled with superstitious practices. Certain yellow flowers were thought to keep fairies 
gates away when hung around the rafters, doors and windows of houses, outhouses and barns. Marshmallows were popular but if you didn't live near a marsh you might also use gorse, firs, primrose, yellow iris or a number of other similarly coloured species to keep our family and livestock safe for the coming year. There were no laws that we know of to protect people picking these, so presumably you had to either be sure you were picking from common land or that you didn't get caught. <laughs> this practice, along with many others based around the festivals of the Irish pagan calendar, is experiencing a noticeable revival in recent years. And if you would like to know how to respectfully incorporate herbs into your Irish pagan practice, or if you'd just like to hear more about how they were used throughout our history and myth here in Ireland, head on over to the Irish Pagan School's website to book your place on my online course which covers everything you need to know. Did you like how I just slid that in there? Smooth. From our earliest written records of herbalism and herb magic in our mythical and historical texts to the witches of the 17th to 19th centuries, right up to the present day, including resources on identification, harvesting and preservation tips, and even some excellent examples of recipes which may have been used to cure particular ailments. This course has everything. We'll even be doing a Q&A at the end where you can ask me any real-time questions you might have and don't worry if you can't catch it live on the day. It can be purchased and watched back at your leisure once the live class is finished. It might take a bit of time to upload but stay tuned and I'll let you know as soon as that's available. You obviously won't get to ask me your questions in person but you will have access to the Q&A which happened on the day. So tell me, what's your favourite wacky medieval medical practice, which herbs might a sick person have stolen from your garden and most importantly do you have any tasty morsels that might be craved by a pregnant woman or a non-pregnant woman? Inquiring minds need to know. And if you enjoyed this video, which you probably did if you're still watching, then please hit the like button just below it so I can keep making more of them. And don't forget to hit subscribe for more fun and witchy adventures. I upload most Thursdays and you're not going to want to miss it. Slán agus bánacht, goodbye, and good luck to you. Oh, he cried. Fine and available. Uh, wacky medieval medical practice. Mm. Ah, we'll try it again. God damn it. Smoke screen targeting women. Targeting. So proper. Ah! Right, this time.